Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Sheckman. On the day after he was sworn in, Donald Trump went to CIA headquarters and said that the U.S. should have kept the Iraqi oil after the drawdown from the Iraq war. And he suggested even that maybe we'll have another chance. He conjured up that old expression, to the victor belong the spoils. In fact, the real victor was supposed to be the Iraqi people. The government claimed to have 45 billion barrels of oil. The sustaining oil revenue was, in the words of the U.S., to make the lives of the Iraqi people immeasurably better. But none of this happened. Instead, a network of corruption, deceit, greed, and mismanagement plundered the oil. How did this happen? Who got rich? How much oil was really there? And what were the real and unintended consequences of that story? That's the story that my guest, investigative journalist Aaron Bonko, tells. Aaron Bonko is an investigative reporter at the Star Ledger and NewJersey.com. Her work focuses on the intersection of money and government. She's a former fellow at the New York Times and the Middle East correspondent for International Business Times. She's covered armed conflict and human rights violations in the Middle East for years. And it is my pleasure to welcome Aaron Bonko here to talk about pipe dreams, the plundering of Iraqis' oil wealth. Aaron, thanks so much for joining us on Radio Who, What, Why. Thanks for having me. In order to understand what happened with the oil and the corruption and the greed and so much of what you write about it in Pipe Dreams, do we need to go back to the beginning and really understand the original sin here and the things that moved us into Iraq in the first place? Yeah, I think that's part of it, definitely. Um, I think what's important to understand when looking at this story is to understand that it, it sort of develops in two separate parts of Iraq, right? It develops in the in Iraqi Kurdistan, which is ruled by the Kurdish regional government, and it unfolds in a similar way in in Iraq proper, which is overseen and run by the central government in Baghdad. And so both have uh, sort of similar stories of, of corruption and plundering of oil wealth, um, and I think what we need to do is start, like you said, from the very beginning and look at how the United States primarily used its leverage with the Kurdish regional government after 2003 when we went into Iraq. That's where it all really begins. And when we went in in 2003, was there, at least as, as you report the story, was there a plan, an idea of how this oil, even the way it was argued at the time, might be used for the betterment of the Iraqi people after the war? Yes. The foundation had had been laid out in the 1990s. The Kurdish regional government had developed a system of contracts, a blueprint for how they were to develop their oil sector in, in that region of Iraq. It had been sort of untapped in a big way, and it had not been developed. And so in the 1990s, they really set out that blueprint, but it didn't really get going until 2003. And so our goal, the U.S. and other Western countries' goal, was to go into this part of Iraq. And, you know, the idea was that the Kurdish regional government and and the government in Baghdad would use the riches from oil sales to rebuild their country after the toppling of Saddam, to sort of build up their economy. Uh, And that was the goal. And that really hasn't happened. And was there a plan how this was supposed to work? Or was it something that was just, we'll see once we do it? There was there was a plan. The, the Kurdish regional government was advised by people in the Bush administration about how it would work. Um, there were exec, executives from oil companies would come into the region um, with staffers from the Bush administration to meet with the Kurdish regional government to sort of lay out how this would happen. And what ended up happening is that the Kurdish regional government uh, ended up handing out contracts to uh, Western oil companies. Um, such as, you know, BP um, and eventually Exxon. And and the idea was that these international oil companies would come in and make a lot of money for themselves, but it would also be giving back to the local economy. Um, And and the idea was that that oil wealth would then flow back into reconstruction projects, building schools, hospitals, uh, which would then employ the local people. And, And what ended up happening, though, was that the region developed into um, a region that's been sort of defined now as the classic resource curse, where uh, the money from 
you know, oil sales has not really flowed back to the individual person into the KRG. Um, And so the local people are suffering. And why didn't it? What started to happen early on in terms of, of the mismanagement and the corruption that prevented this from all happening? So I think the corruption really started when the Kurdish regional government began to uh, gain momentum in the sense that it started to take on real powerful allies, um, such as the United States, such as the UK. Um, And they really felt that their bid for independence from Baghdad was a real possibility for them. As more international oil companies started coming into the region um, and exploring uh, and putting more money into the region, uh, the, the Kurdish regional government really felt they had a fighting chance. And so uh, with that came a lot of power and greed. Um, you know, th- that region of Iraq is based, uh, historically based on, on uh, political rivalries. Um, you know, it's a clan-based society. You have two sort of powerful families vying for power. And as you vie for power, you vie for control over um, the money. And the money really was all in the oil sector. And so um, that was the foundation for which um, the corruption really built itself up from. Um, and so as things developed, those two warring political factions um, did everything they could to get control of that money and then feed it back into their political parties. A lot of it ended up into the pockets of uh, individuals who were leaders of those parties. Um, and so that's really how it unwinded. And a lot of kickbacks went on, which was also a source of the money. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. So uh, when you when you talk to people who do business in the Middle East, particularly Iraq, they often say, well, you know, kickbacks are just part of the game. This is just the way things work there. You have to provide gifts in order to get what you want. Um, but it's really not that way. <laughs> I think in Iraq is a highly unregulated, unregulated um their oil sector is highly unregulated. And so a lot of things went on between the cracks that no one knew about or knew about and kept quiet. Um, and so one particular kickback that that I'm thinking of is one that I outline in the book where a prominent Middle Eastern oil and natural gas company um, sends you know, 12 armored vehicles to the Ministry of Natural Resource in the Kurdish regional government to staffers there um, one week before their contract is signed. Um, and so I was able to get a hold of those records that detail that shipment um, and sort of lay out that kickback. And, and there were lots of instances like that that happened um, as international oil companies tried to get those contracts. Um, and those kickbacks were, were kickbacks right into the pockets or into the hands of those in control of the oil in the Kurdish regional government. One of the other things you point out is that there was less oil than people originally anticipated. Talk about that. Sure. Again, I think it's important to distinguish between the northern part of Iraq and the in Iraqi Kurdistan, and then in Iraq proper. Um, in the northern part of Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan, there had been seismic studies done. You know, people had sort of been studying this land for decades since the '60s. Uh, but no one had really explored beneath the sand, beneath the land. And I think there was an overestimation of how much was really under there. Um, and so it wasn't until international oil companies started exploring that they realized that the the amount of oil that had first been put out number-wise as, as to what was underneath the ground wasn't really accurate. Um, and so Iraqi Kurdistan's oil only makes up a small portion of Iraq's overall oil. Um, But the reasons why international oil companies wanted to get into that part of Iraq during the Iraq war was because it was untapped. Um, It was sort of anyone's game. Anyone could get in there as long as they made the right connections with the Kurdish regional government. Um, But a lot of international oil companies have had disappointing results and have actually pulled out of that region because they weren't able to make a profit. Talk a little bit about the multinationals and, and how they read the situation in terms of the warring families, in terms of the political equation there, and how they played into that. I think there was a lack of education on the part of the multinational oil companies about the Kurdish regional government. 
for a long time, many of them had only dealt with the central government in Baghdad. Uh, and things aren't straightforward there either, but at least um, there was, you know, sort of one ministry of oil that you went to and you dealt with a couple of people in that ministry um, and things were a little bit more standard in terms of how you got your permits and contracts. Um, but in the Kurdish regional government, things were uh, a little hazy. There wasn't a clear uh, roadmap right away to um, how to get a permit or a contract to explore in that region. And so a lot of companies went in blind um, and expected you know, that things would go smoothly for them. But what they found was that the two warring parties in that region created a lot of problems for them. It was very unclear who to negotiate with. Uh, it, it wasn't clear who you were dealing with at any one given time. Uh, there were a lot of things going on behind the scenes in the political realm in Iraqi Kurdistan that they didn't learn about until later. And so it wasn't until really 2005, 2006 that uh the Ministry of Natural Resources in Iraqi Kurdistan uh, hired a man named Ashby Harami, who was who is, was and now is the leader of the Ministry of Natural Resources, and he sort of handles everything there. Um, but even with his leadership, there there is still rivalry in the political system uh, and, and still people trying to influence contracts behind closed doors. So I think what they found and they learned very quickly was that uh, gaining a contract in that region was extremely difficult, A, and B, even if you did gain a contract in that region, the terms of that contract were not going to be easy to negotiate. Was this a successful endeavor for these big oil companies, for uh, Exxon and the rest of them? I think it's different for every international oil company. The contract terms change from company to company. I mean, you have standard terms in the contracts, but um, the royalties and the payments often uh, shift slightly. And I think it depends on uh, how much capital an international oil company has coming into the region, how much money they have to begin with. Um, it depends on their resources. But I think for a lot of companies, it was not a fruitful endeavor. I think for the smaller exploration and production companies, um, it, it, it was a big loss for them. They found out that, uh, you know, the political system was too hard to navigate. Um, there wasn't enough um, oil underneath the ground to make a profit, you know, difficult exploration results. And so we've seen since the late 1990s to until now, a lot of companies pull out of the region, those who can't handle operating on debt. Um, for Exxon, Exxon was different. Exxon... Um, I think it was a good move for them in the short term because they were able to um, hold influence in, the, in Iraqi Kurdistan and to negotiate a really good deal. Now they've all but pulled out of the region and uh, are just operating in Iraq proper. Um, so I think it, dif it differs you know, from company to company. But I think for the larger international oil companies, it, it was a fine move. I think for the smaller ones who, you know, as I said, can't operate on debt. Uh, it, it was very difficult for them. Who got rich in all of this? Definitely not the people of Iraqi Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. Iraqi Kurdistan locals have suffered tremendously. The people who really benefited from this oil sector system are the political parties, those who lead the political parties, the Barzani family, the Talibani family, uh, and, and those in between, those who work in the Ministry of Natural Resources, Ashdi Harami, um, and then I think there were certain uh, executives of, of international oil companies that also made a great deal. Gulf Keystone Petroleum did well. Uh, the executives of that company, um, I think, you know, benefited from existing in the region. Uh, but I think for the most part, most of the wealth flowed to staffers, uh, government members in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, and, and the political parties, like I said, the Barzani family, the Talibani family, uh, the Kurdish Democratic Party, which is known as the KDP, uh, and also the PUK political system did well. What, if anything, did the Iraqi public in Kurdistan, what did they know about what was going on? What did they sense and how did they react to it? You know, it, truth is very hard to come by in Iraq. Uh, and especially in Iraqi Kurdistan, they are known, the government in Iraqi Kurdistan, the Kurdish regional government is known for their lack of transparency. 
So in terms of the innuendos and the minutia of what went on behind closed doors in terms of oil in Iraqi Kurdistan, there was not much that the people knew about. I think what they saw was international companies coming in, promising to rebuild, promising wealth. And I think that gave them a lot of, of hope. I think that they were very hopeful that their country uh, would sort of improve, especially their economy with all the wealth coming into the country. Um, but I think a lot of them are now bitter and cynical um, about Western interventionism, about promises made for bettering their economy. And so I, I think now that there's still a lot people don't know and don't understand. I think even reporters have a hard time getting to the truth about the oil sector in Iraqi Kurdistan. It wasn't until I really got my hands on documents um, from regulatory enforcement officers who have been studying this for decades that I, I really began to understand how much hadn't um, been put out there and how much was hidden. Um, so I think that there's still a lot people just don't understand, and I think that's what's frustrating them. And what did the U.S. government know about this, and and what was their role, if any, in all of this? The, West, the, the U.S. government knew about the corruption in Iraqi Kurdistan. There are cables um, that have been published on WikiLeaks um, and elsewhere that sort of outline the corruption in Iraqi Kurdistan within the Kurdish regional government. Um, but but that chaos played to the U.S.'s advantage. advantage. Um, you know, they, they saw the chaos as a benefit. Uh, they thought within that political chaos they could strike better deals, especially, um, you know, strike better deals with international oil companies. Um, they thought, hey, if we can have U.S. companies come into this region and, and sign contracts and get good contracts out of this government, then that's great for us. So there wasn't a real push to uh, improve transparency or to try to address corruption head on in the early days of the Iraq war because it worked to our advantage. Um, and I think that even now, even today, um, years later, the corruption issue has still not been addressed by the U.S. head on. Um, and it, and it, is now being addressed by local politicians in the Kurdish regional government. But overall, the U.S. has had little to say about it. And how is it being addressed today, even locally? So locally right now, transparency and corruption are huge talking points, especially in the lead-up to the elections in May. Um, a lot of political leaders are using it um, as a platform um, they're coming out and, and asking for you know the main political parties uh, the leaders of those parties to talk more about what went on behind the scenes in the oil sector. Right now, uh, the Kurdish regional government has an auditing firm in the region, uh, Deloitte and Ernst and Young, creating reports about where all the oil money went. Um, the problem with that audit, though, is that it only goes back so far. It only goes back four or five years. What really needs to be done is we need to understand, you know, where the money went starting in 1990. Uh, there needs to be a full audit done, you know, starting then up until now. Um, and so, you know, uh, opposition parties to the KDP and PUK, excuse me, are, are calling on those two main political parties to open up the books and show the people what happened to the money. Um, I think that is going to be a big issue leading up to the elections in May. Is it your sense that we'll ever find out or that the Iraqi people will ever find out what really happened to the money? I mean, I try, I try to address what happened to the money in the book. And I think, you know, as I say in the introduction, this is just a sliver of what could be told on this subject. I think we know that there is a system of corruption that has benefited, you know, the parties, uh, the PUK and the KD, KDP and uh, the leaders of those political parties, we, we know about the kickbacks, um, but there are, there's a chunk of money that we still don't know about. And I think unless there's an audit conducted that goes all the way back until the 1990s and it's fully transparent and independent, we won't really ever know what happened. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really big issue for Iraq moving forward. I think there are a lot of unanswered questions that people have that are, you know, the people living in Iraqi Kurdistan still have these questions, and I don't think that they'll ever ever feel comfortable with their political system unless some of these questions are answered. What about the broader geopolitical implications of all of this as it relates to 
to Iraq in general, to the, the stability of the government in Iraq, etc.? So I think geopolitically, uh, moving forward from, from here on out, um, there are a lot of things that need to be addressed in Iraq um, before the country stabilizes. There's a lot of arguments and tension between Erbil, the capital of Iraqi Kurdistan, and the central government in Baghdad, and it's all over oil right now. So the central government and our bill are fighting over who has access to oil revenues, who has control of oil revenues. Um, and, and the Kurdish regional government really um, is sort of at a loss. Their economy is in a tailspin. Uh, they have no leverage. Baghdad right now has all the leverage. Um, and so until those two parties come to an agreement ab- about ways in which to split oil revenue um, and who controls that oil revenue and who controls the oil fields even, I don't think that Iraq will be stable until that happens. I think there, it is a very um, unstable political atmosphere right now, um, and hopefully things will sort of even out in, in the run-up to the elections. But I, I don't see a ne- them coming to a, a compromise anytime soon. And this is the major issue for Iraq right now. And the U.S. has sort of tried to stay out of it um, in, in a way. Uh, they've tried to, um, you know, give messages of let's keep everything calm, let's keep everything peaceful, but they haven't really, um, at least publicly, said anything influential, influential one way or another. Um, the other thing to consider here is that the Kurdish regional government held a referendum uh, in the fall, in September, October, um, for, you know, they, they voted for independence, and, and that bid for independence was shut down. Um, and so I think there are a lot of angry people in the Kurdish regional government right now in, in Iraqi Kurdistan that are bitter about that. Um, so that's another issue that needs to be resolved. You know, what happened with that referendum? Why didn't it go through? Why, why wasn't it upheld? Um, so, again, those are two big issues, oil and, and independence, that need to really be tackled before we can see any sort of stability in the country. And what is the role, if any, of the multinational oil companies now? Are they just sitting back and waiting? Where are they in all of this today? The multinational oil companies in Iraq, especially in Iraqi Kurdistan, don't really have a big role right now. A lot of them are still waiting for payments from the government. Um, they're hoping that once things get resolved between Erbil and Baghdad, that payments will continue to flow regularly and in full. Um, so their role right now is really just a waiting game. And what is your sense of what will happen with these upcoming elections in May? I think we don't really know what's going to happen in May. Like I said, there are still a lot of outstanding issues that need to be resolved before those elections go ahead. I think that it's it's tough to sort of predict what's going to happen in May before we even have an understanding of, of how these negotiations between Erbil and Baghdad are going to come to an end. I think it's really too early to tell. Uh, like I said, the main issue right now is getting Erbil and Baghdad to that negotiating table and getting that compromise you know, sealed. Um, it's really, um, that needs to be the first focus. And I think the elections are sort of so far off in, in everyone's mind right now because there's so much that needs to be done before that. And how big is the pot of money that we're talking about? How how much is involved here? Do we have a sense of that? Yeah. Um, when we're looking at Iraqi Kurdistan and the oil sector there, uh, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and, you know, there are some reports uh, about um, how much has been lost to fraud and mismanagement in Iraq as a whole. Um, and they vary. They vary from, you know, uh, you know, 20 million to, you know, 100 billion. So there's really no accurate um, depiction of how much has been lost to fraud and mismanagement in Iraq as a whole. Um, but I will say that from the documents that I've obtained, uh, that it's in the billions. Billions of dollars have been lost to uh, corruption uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan specifically. Um, I, I didn't look at um, Iraq as a whole, but I, I focus very much so on the Kurdish regional government. And how much is, of this is being reported in Iraq? How much is filtering down to, to the people there? there? There's quite a bit of reporting on oil uh, in Iraq itself. Um, most of the reporting focuses on 
who will have access to oil revenues. There's very little reporting on corruption in the oil sector. It's very difficult for reporters there to do that story because there's a lot of intimidation. Freedom of the press is very low there. Um, you know, people have been killed in this country for trying to report this story. And um, so I think that's a big problem. Uh, also, a lot of the media companies in Iraqi Kurdistan are owned by people in the political spectrum. So, um, you know, while reporters in these companies try to do their best to get to the truth, they're often limited by who their bosses are. And finally, is there anything that the U.S. could do, should do, to help the situation there? You know, it's really tough to say what the U.S. role is right now. Um, I think that they're sort of trying to just keep the peace between Erbil and Baghdad. They have historically aligned publicly with Baghdad uh, and sort of let the Kurds out to dry a bit, um, especially when it comes to their bid for independence. Um, Behind the scenes, they've been very supportive of the oil sector, but publicly um, and politically have not been so supportive. So I think right now um, the plan for the U.S. is to try to sit back as much as possible and let the Erbil and Baghdad try to figure it out. But I think that their influence will become even more important uh, as elections edge closer. And has policy changed with the current administration and the current secretary of state who comes out of this world of big oil? Honestly, our current uh, State Department is very... um, sort of our current State Department has not really had a vested interest in Iraq as I thought it would have with Rex Tillerson um, as a leader. We've seen very um, few discussions between the State Department and Iraq, at least publicly. Um, I I had thought that given Rex Tillerson's position, um, the former CEO of Exxon and his position in the State Department, I had thought that there would be more action between the State Department and the U.S. and and Iraq, um, specifically in Iraqi Kurdistan. But we've seen those conversations have been very few and far between. Um, The U.S. uh, has sort of taken a back seat to the conversations that are ongoing between Erbil and Baghdad. Um, And it's sort of hard to understand what the State Department is actually doing at this point uh, to help the situation. Part of it is that the State Department um, is understaffed, wildly understaffed, Mm -hmm. uh, and the staff members that are there aren't necessarily versed on the issues, and I think that's the major problem. And are there any other global players in the region right now? Yes, definitely. I mean, I think when you look at what international companies exist in the region um, and in the country as a whole, you have other players. You have Iran is a huge player right now. They're trying to tap into the oil market in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, and our, that's their main sort of push right now. And their interaction with the Kurdish government has been about oil. Uh, I think the U.K. has a, a vested interest in the region, um, given their companies that exist there. Um, and then you also have China and Russia, who are big players in the oil sector in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, Russia, Russia's Rosneft has signed a, a huge deal uh, over the past year uh, with Iraqi Kurdistan, with the Kurdish regional government. And I think um, we're now seeing Russia emerge as a major player in the oil sector uh, in the region, which we didn't really see before. Exxon, the U.S. and the U.K. was really dominant in the 19, uh, not late 1990s and as in, during the first you know, 30 years of the Iraq war. But now Russia has really taken over. And when you say taken over, how big a role do you see them continuing to play? I think Russia, um, we don't really know about Russia's relationship with the Kurdish regional government. Um, We don't really know about the details of Russia's relationship with the Kurdish regional government um, yet. That contract was signed just about eight or nine months ago. So there's still a lot we don't understand about that contract and the nuances of it and how it works. Um, They've offered upfront payments to the Kurdish regional government. we don't really know the exact nature of those payments and how they'll be paid out, but there's a lot of money that exists when, within the contract that we know. And we know historically that the more money is involved in your contract, the more influence that you have with the Kurdish regional government. So it's safe to say that an awful lot of the corruption is still going on today, maybe with different players. It is safe. It is safe to say the corruption still exists today in the oil sector in Iraqi Kurdistan. There are different players now. 
but the same system um, is still being used by the Ministry of Natural Resources in Iraqi Kurdistan. And that's because some of the main players that uh, created that blueprint, that created that system, are still leading. Uh, Ashley Harami, for one, his staffers. Um, and there, there are a lot of side deals still going on that sort of um, are taking place and are playing out in London right now. Um, and I think we'll begin to see some of this play out in the course over the next five to ten years. Erin Bonko, her book is Pipe Dreams, The Plundering of Iraqi's Oil Wealth. Erin, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.